Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much, and uh, thanks for the invitation to uh, to speak today. Um, I was uh, asked, as you say, to speak about sediment budgets, and I'm definitely going to do that a little bit. But I'm also hopefully going to convince that there's a, a little bit more than just uh, sediment budgets. Is not really uh, describing the <clears throat> the whole kind of issue from a physical process perspective. Um, so uh, just a, a bit of an introduction uh, of myself first. So I'm a geomorphologist uh, out of Northwest Hydraulics Consultants, where I do uh, my applied work, but I'm also set up as an adjunct professor at SFU uh, through the School of Environmental Science, uh, where I continue to uh, uh, work on my research uh, problems uh, with support of, of NHC. So broadly, my focus on the dynamics of, of large lowland rivers, uh, like the Fraser and, and almost entirely on the Fraser. Uh, but I'm also actively involved with uh, smaller gravel bed rivers, as well as, as the big bedrock uh, canyons in the Fraser Canyon. So specific research projects uh, I have going on now is, is working on how we improve flood uh, modeling. Uh, I'm very actively involved uh, in a large project right now, uh, looking at building and improving uh, a sediment budget from mission downstream to the ocean. And uh, through most of my career, I got started looking at dune dynamics and how dunes in the Fraser uh, contribute to sediment transport and actually influence uh, water levels. And, and as I say, all of this is, is with a, a primarily with a, a Fraser focus. But additionally, I also play on, on, on the Fraser. Um, you know, this is a, it's a really special place for me. I go there with friends and family and, and then a lot of times just by myself to reflect and and kind of recharge and it's become like a fairly spiritual uh, place for me. So, you know, before I move forward, I want to uh, explicitly acknowledge that, you know, most of the, the work and the play that I do is on the traditional territory of the Halkameum speaking uh, peoples. And uh, it means so much to me to spend time here uh, exploring and learning this landscape that I couldn't even begin to imagine what it would be like to, to have this land stolen away. So, you know, most of the stuff I'm going to talk today about is physical, the physical landscape, but, you know, I want us to be mindful uh, that folks were flourishing here and, and the Fraser itself was flourishing here before um, we settlers showed up and, and it, they continue to survive and thrive today, but, you know, they're more than deserving to have a lot of this power uh, shifted back uh, to be able to actually have uh, more and more strong roles in, in managing this, this landscape. Okay, so uh, onwards to the physical processes. So uh, I'm not a biologist. I probably should have said that right away. Uh, so my focus is going to be uh, specifically uh, on the physical processes that are happening here. Um, <clears throat> so the Fraser itself is the 80th largest river in the world in terms of discharge. And it drains uh, a substantial bit of BC uh, through the plateaus and fringing mountains. And a really unique uh, characteristic of the Fraser, of course, is the, the freshet, where we have a 20-fold uh, change in, in discharge annually. You know, we have our uh, low, low winter flows, and then in May, June, and July, the, the flow kicks up as, as the snow melts in the mountains. Uh, another really unique bit of, of the Fraser Basin is that uh, we have a really substantial uh, annual sediment flux, which is largely due to the fact that we don't have uh, much in the way of main stem dams on, on the Fraser itself. Uh, which is a very unique uh, thing for a river this big in the world. And all of these kind of physical conditions uh, work uh, to produce uh, to make for a system that's uh, excellent for producing uh, Pacific salmon. <clears throat> so when we talk about uh, the Fraser morphology uh, broadly here, uh, what we're looking at is a river profile. So on the y-axis, we've got our bed elevation and then looking at distance upstream from the ocean. So in the in the upper upper basin where things are super steep, uh, you know we have a system that's that's draining these really uh, steep mountains, these cold mountains. You know water leaves these mountains and, and works its way through these uh, plateaus between them. And then when you get down to around the Chilcolton River confluence, uh, the river morphology drastically changes to this really dramatic uh, bedrock canyon landscape. And with that, there's a really steep uh, change in the slope of the, the gradient of the river, uh, and it moves a lot of sediment uh, through there. By the time you get past Hope, there's another break in slope where things get less steep, and uh, that sediment falls out, 
and deposits on the bed. And, and as a result, this is where we get the, the unique uh, gravel bedded uh, morphology that we see on the Fraser with all these little, all these islands, uh, all these channels, uh, some vegetated, some not vegetated, but a very actively moving channel. When we get past uh, mission, uh, you know, we enter this kind of pseudo meandering pattern where we've got vegetated islands, uh, just kind of found on the inside and outside of bends, but a very uh, uh, kind of single threaded uh, meandering pattern. When we hit New West, uh, we basically hit the industrial uh, 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 delta where people live and, and there's a lot of shipping. And then of course the river exits out in the ocean at uh, sand heads. So today, uh, specifically, uh, we're talking about the gravel bedded uh, part of the, of the, of the river. Uh, and usually this would be kind of defined from a physical uh, process stand, uh, standpoint from about Sumas Mountain up to Hope, uh, where there's a really sharp transition at Sumas Mountain where the bed goes from a gravel bedded to, to a sand bedded uh, channel. So all of this uh, geomorphology works to, to make really rich salmon uh, habitat and uh, productivity, which I don't need to convince anyone really about this, but it does give me a chance to speak a little bit of, of the, geom the geomorphology. So, uh, you know, we've got lots of adjacent lakes and tributaries that are really important uh, habitat for the fish. Uh, like I said earlier with the snowmelt hydrograph, where we've got this reliable pattern of flow and cold water, that steep basin gives us that cold water. Uh, you know, every year we can count on there being low flow uh, in the wintertime as most of that water is stored up in the basement, uh, basin as snow. And then uh, when April hits, you know, we get this warming up of the basin and all that stored volume comes down uh, in, the, in the form of, uh, of water and uh, increases the, the discharge drastically. So on the, on the left here, I just plotted up the 2020 hydrograph just to kind of demonstrate that hydrograph uh, pattern. Uh, the sediment transport and the turbidity uh, allow for a great uh, protection for the fish uh, where, you know, they can kind of hide from predators. There's also all these side channels that uh, folks have already been talking about that provide uh, refuge uh, during the freshet. And uh, as Mike was talking about in that last presentation, there's this unique uh, glacial uh, history that provides uh, pretty substantial uh, readily available gravel supplies. So. It wasn't that uh, many years ago in terms of geologic time where we were covered in meters and meters and meters of ice. The landscape would have looked like something like this. That ice retreated. It left behind uh, all of these hill slopes with this really nice uh, readily available uh, gravel supply. That gravel comes off the hill slopes into the river and uh, gets down to the gravel bedded reach and uh, where it's used by fish. Uh, I think these are pink salmon spawning uh, grounds here. Uh, where they use them uh, uh, to spawn and uh, continue on. <clears throat> so I want to focus in a bit specifically now on these sediment dynamics. So like I said uh, earlier, from the Fraser Canyon to Hope, uh, you can see it here from about 200 to 400 or 450, 500 kilometers. We have a fairly steep gradient. And then when we get to Hope, that gradient uh, breaks and it becomes less steep. And as a result, the sediment that's being transported, the, the heavier material uh, falls out uh, and uh, forms something that kind of looks like this cartoon. So you can imagine that uh, brown kind of delta uh, triangle shape uh, would be at the peak of it there would be where hope is. Sediment shoots through the canyons, through the mountains, and then deposits it out kind of in this fan morphology. But the river can't transport all the sediment that's coming through, uh, you know, these gravels. Uh, because of that uh, slope break. And it's forced to have to kind of start cutting through its own deposits and, and moving sediment uh, in different ways through scour and deposition uh, um, processes. So we get kind of this really unique and distinct morphology from anywhere else uh, on the Fraser. And the sediment moves in, in, in a really unique way uh, through here compared to say the sand bedded uh, portion of the river. So uh, on the right here, uh, we have a cartoon uh, you know, uh, you can follow what the kind of idealized gravel bedded river would look like. Those black arrows represent the flow direction. Uh, you know, if you follow from the top going down, uh, you can see the flow cuts into the bank where you see erosion. And then this erosion is then compensated by deposition down on a downstream bar. So the bed material uh, doesn't move continuously like you might imagine in the lower reach where uh, sand is picked up and, and, and transported for kilometers. 
it's uh, more of a like a less than a kilometer, less than a couple of kilometer stepwise per freshette. So that scour we see on the banks or of different bars is compensated by a deposition that would happen just downstream or even sometimes quite laterally. And and a really really cool uh, stat here um, that is you know the, we've kind of estimated that about maybe two to three million cubic uh, uh, meters of sediment per year shifts around but only 200,000 cubic meters per year is inputted in. So uh, usually if you're thinking about inputs and outputs, they, they you wouldn't see so much shifting around like that. Uh, there's way more shifting than what's going in and what's going out. So that means there's a lot of lateral uh, movement. You know, and, the, and these bars, they grow, sometimes they become vegetated and stable through time, uh, but then uh, even the vegetated ones can get taken down by the scour and deposition pro uh, process. So it's a very unique kind of uh, way for the sediment to move through here. And then uh, this uh, unique sediment transport uh, actually leads to a really kind of cool uh, way that the, the river changes through time. So here we're looking at a time lapse of the Fraser. This is in the, in the top left here is the Harrison uh, confluence. And uh, I highlighted just a few boxes where there's some really interesting stuff going going uh, going on. So on the left here, um, if you see from 1958, this starts. Or, sorry, 1985, this starts till till now. Uh, you can kind of see that there's these waves of sediment erosion or sediment that come through and create these different uh, kind of flapping morphology of the of the channel. So the the point is like a lot of this is very uh, dynamic and not ever staying in place because of this scour and deposition pattern. You know, the one in the middle here shows a really big kind of wave pushed through through time. And on the right uh, is a really interesting one. You know, it's almost just moving laterally. There's almost no downstream movement. Most of it's moving south as this uh, deposition is, uh, or the scour is compensated with deposition that's happening. So all of the species that, that live through here have to be adapted to this uh, kind of really uh, complex morphology and complex changes. You know, 1985, this much change through time is, is, uh, is quite substantial. So there, there have been some attempts to develop a sediment budget or sediment budgets through, through the river. Uh, this portion of the river, uh, but it's it's very hard. So the, the sediment budgets are not that we have are not really at a point where they're they're you know very extremely applicable tools. Uh, you know, a lot of it requires a lot of measurements all the time to figure out what the bed is. Uh, so this requires constant monitoring through through many decades. And the work that's been done has been using a lot of aerial photos to see how the morphology has changed, and then that's used to infer what the volumes would be. So that's a bit of a limitation. The other limitation is that a lot of this stopped basically in the early 2000s when uh, Mike Church's group at UBC kind of stopped working on the problem. But uh, at least it does give us some idea of what is going on with uh, the volumetric changes through time, uh, at least qualitatively. So uh, on this plot here, we have on the left side is the actual change in cubic meters of sediment. And on the bottom is the river kilometer up from Sandheads. And you can see the limit of the gravel reach around Sumasa River there at about 100 uh, KMs from uh, Sandheads. Um, if you look above zero, that means that there's more sediment in 1991 than there was in 1950. And if you look below that line in the negatives, that means there's less sediment in 1990 than there was in 1952. And two uh, things really uh, jump out. The first is this uh, kind of uh, positive change in the lower half of the reach. And a lot of this has been attributed to the, the, the mining, uh, the, the gold rush in the 1800s, pumping in a lot of sediment directly into the channel, kind of just as waste, you know. Settlers went in and just, uh, tore apart the mountainsides looking for gold and dumped the sediment directly in. So this is the, the link that's been made, is that that sediment is kind of moving through as a pulse. It was kind of an instantaneous big input that slowly works its way through through the river. And you can see in this in the dark green uh, color uh, on these plots is that a lot of the sediment has already actually been removed uh, through um, mining. The other thing that jumps out is that uh, on the right side of the curve, so this would be of the plot um, at the upper part of the gravel bedded reach, 
we actually had less sediment coming in at the end of the of the 1900s uh, than we did in the mid bit of the 1900s, suggesting that that supply shift uh, associated with that uh, input is is over, and there's just less sediment coming in than there was. Of course, this only goes to the year 2000, so what's been happening for the last two decades is uh, pretty unclear. <clears throat> so uh, with that, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. Uh, it's definitely connected and, and I'll hopefully make that connection by the end, but I wanna talk about how we manage flood uh, risk on the Fraser. So, um, you know, the, there's always every year a flood risk uh, associated with that freshet, uh, depending on how much snow is stored in the, in the, in the uh, basin and how fast it warms up in the spring. And I don't necessarily think we need to see any more flood photos given what happened in November uh, in the lower mainland. But, you know, a kind of an important context for that is that the Fraser didn't have a big flood. Uh, those were all the, the smaller tributaries coming through and flooding out. So our largest flood on settler record is uh, 1894 in Chilliwack, and this was 17,000, estimated to be 17,000 cubic meters per second. If we look at Chilliwack, uh, then some of these historic photos show that, you know, Chilliwack was basically uh, underwater. In 1948, we had our second biggest uh, flood on the gauge record. Uh, again, Chilliwack flooded out. And if you look upriver from Sumas Mountain, you can see that the whole, uh, uh, valley is filled with water. And this 1948 flood drove a lot of the flood mitigation uh, practices that we see today, because in 1948, there was a lot more uh, people and a lot more infrastructure. So there was kind of a pressing need to actually develop some ways to mitigate this, this flood risk. I should also note that, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, from the Stolo uh, oral history, a lot more uh, you know, uh, oral history and tales of there being much larger uh, floods than this. So it's a bit naive of us to think that that uh, 1948 or, or 18, uh, late 1800s flood was uh, the biggest we'll ever see. And this is a risk every year. I mean, even in 2012, we had what was approaching our 20 year flood. Uh, and we did see some, uh, some areas go over bank, especially off on the inside of, of dikes. So. It's something we have to be aware of uh, as a possibility every every year. So the traditional ways about going about uh, flood management in the in the Fraser has been through uh, a few things, but the the a big one in the kind of before the last decade or so was large scale sediment removals. So these were perceived to reduce flood risk. The idea was you would remove sediment and there'd be more uh, space for the water to go, but at the end of the day. You know, there are lots of studies that show that this was actually not exactly true. Just to go in and remove sediments uh, didn't actually improve flood or limit the flood risk. And there's a few other uh, concerns with this. I mean, the sediment budget uh, that's been developed shows that there is a, a lowering or degradation pattern upstream. So even though there may be an apparent increase in sediment on the, the downstream end of the, of the river, um, of the gravel bedded reach, uh, we can't really start going in there and just removing more and more sediment if there's less sediment coming in. And of course, this uh, is highly invasive and, and does substantial harm to, to river ecosystems. Another approach, uh, of course, that we all, we all know well are, are the dikes. So we have, uh, this is an example looking towards Mission here at, uh, at uh, Matsquai uh, Bend. Uh, there's this, you know, dikes all along the river. You can see it. I just threw arrows on, but you can trace it all the way back through uh, down on the Abbotsford side here. And if we just put up a, a map showing where these dikes are, so there's uh, so these black bolded lines on the on the north side of the channel show where the dikes are, and then the the red on the on the south side are showing where the the dikes are. Basically, the whole bit is either mountain or uh, constrained by dikes, dikes that are in place. And in some places, like on the upper right corner, uh, on both the uh, kind of Chilliwack and, and Kent side, uh, the dikes are right up against the, the river and uh, kind of laterally constraining, constraining it. And in order to protect these dikes, uh, we have to do a lot of bank modification, uh, which is widespread uh, throughout the river. Uh, you know, the river wants to cut into the into the uh, land, 
uh, as its natural process, but that's where our dikes are. So we have to protect the dikes if we want to protect the people. So as a result, what we've done is, is dumped a lot of hardening uh, material there, uh, which then stops the river from, from going on with its natural uh, processes. At the same time, we've also uh, closed many of these side channels in the name of uh, flood mitigation. Uh, which, you know, the Fraser, for example, the Nickelman here used to cut in there. Uh, there's many of these examples throughout, but now it's blocked off. Uh, so the Fraser can as easily go in there and kind of rejuvenate uh, that habitat. So the system response to what we're seeing to all of these changes that uh, have been mostly imposed on the river is an overall uh, narrowing of, of the gravel bedded reach. So this figure here on the on the x-axis, we've got the morphological reach. So it's just um, areas of similar morphology kind of lumped together. So you would think Sumas Mountain on the left side all the way up uh, to uh, towards Hope. If you follow the, the black line or the, the blue line and the purple line, the blue line are darker colors here. We see that the river has been was wider in the early 1900s. Uh, but then moving towards the year 2000, we see that it's uh, showing an overall narrowing uh, pattern. And uh, this is a lot of in the name of um, flood mitigation, but by narrowing the channel, we're actually decreasing the storage of, of, the, of the river, uh, forcing us to build higher dikes, um, whereas the wider channels have more capacity to, to store a lot of this water that's coming through. And with this narrowing, of course, uh, most folks here know better than I, you, you lose substantial habitat in these sidebars and, and channel, uh, or sorry, these side channels and, and bars. <clears throat> so uh, from a physical uh, perspective, the, the key to maintaining this, this river ecosystem is to maintain its banks and let the river continue to shift back and forth uh, naturally within its, within its floodplain. And I noticed that uh, after the November floods, a lot of uh, people who I work with uh, took to the news and said, oh, this is why you shouldn't build uh, and live near rivers. Um, you know, the river wants, it needs room to breathe. And of course, they're, they're right, but I found it a bit frustrating because people live near the river and infrastructure are built beside the river. So we can't just simply let the river go wild. <clears throat> But there are lots of things to consider. For example, uh, setting back the dikes just to, in, in places where we can, you know, we can go out and identify areas where land can be bought back or uh, just simply dikes can be moved back to open up uh, some of this riparian habitat and give that, that river a bit more room to, to breathe. But it's, it's really difficult to make decisions like this unless we know what the long-term past and future trends of the river are on a whole, on a whole. So this, uh, this is a very wordy slide, but uh, kind of outlines, you know, what my ideal world would be for physically uh, a physical uh, river management plan, or at least to get some points just for us to get talking about it. Uh, you know, we need some sort of river management plan uh, that aims at long-term stewardship of the river. And, you know, this would ensure we, we have data collected and analyzed that can be used um, with numerical models to, uh, start to understand what's happening at the whole river. A lot of what's, what's going on, I think now or in the last, well, maybe forever has been very piecemeal. So a lot of great stuff has been going on, but other folks don't know that it's going on or it's just in this one area. And uh, I think we need kind of a river management plan that, that has uh, oversight for the, the whole system. And then once we start understanding, you know, where the river has migrated through in the past and, and, and where it's going, uh, once we have all these, these data sets, uh, we can start understanding how much uh, river the space needs or how much, how much uh, space the river needs. And, you know, we can start doing things like identifying where dikes could be or should be set back, you know, where we can op open up some more riparian land and, and reserve it. Uh, you know, we'll be better able to identify where dikes need upgrading. We don't often we don't have a good idea exactly how rivers will spawn, respond in the long term to, to different engineering disturbances like bank hardening or, or bridges. Um, you know, this information will, will let us develop a, a, a sediment budget in more detail that, that could be used to do things like consider very local targeted sediment re removals that may actually improve uh, scour and flooding. 
And, uh, you know, this kind of plan would let us start thinking about where we could open up a uh, side channel uh, a bit more as well. Uh, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll conclude here uh, with some summary points, just that, you know, the unique kind of geomorphology and, and physical processes of the gravel bed of Fraser make for great uh, salmon and, and both uh, sturgeon habitat. Um, but also these processes of setup and transport that make it so unique also make mitigation of flood risk uh, challenging. And I think our current and kind of historical overall porches have been kind of on a piece by piece basis. Uh, and then a lot of the, the um, mitigation activities we've done are, are destroying key habitat. So uh, I think that the way forward would be a plan that, that needs to start monitoring and managing the river all the way from Hope down to Sandheads. Uh, those two systems, the gravel bedded and the sand bedded uh, reach, are not uh, separate totally from each other. Um, so we need a plan that bridges across those two, those from Hope down to the ocean. And I, I think that we have the opportunity, and I'm, and I'm so glad that everybody's here talking about this stuff today, to actually work on figuring out what this management plan could look like uh, in order to both reduce these flood risks, uh, but at the same time restoring crucial habitat, because I'm definitely convinced that those two things uh, can happen simultaneously rather than against each other as, as they have been. So thanks, everybody.